we speak to the chairperson of the committee looking into her fitness to hold office. As urban poet Kendrick Lamar says, we're going to be right, we're going to be all right. Once upon a time, the ANC is a rising star. Imagine Malusi Kikaba rising again and becoming the party's next secretary general. He's in the building for a conversation with me. And summit host President Cyril Ramaphosa and his cabinet come under fire for dropping the ball in the fight against gender-based violence. All that coming up in tonight's episode of The Watchdog, which starts right now. Suspended public protector advocate Busuam Kwebane says her legal team has not withdrawn from representing her. This comes after her legal counsel advocate Dalim Bofu staged an impromptu walkout from the parliamentary inquiry last week. Um, Kwebane's legal team was also not present on Friday. It was a political tug of war as parties differed on how the inquiry should proceed, Mkwebane cut a lone figure as the legal representative, Fios Yanejo, joined on the virtual platform. We had a long consultation over the phone yesterday, and as well they have sent you a letter as uh, the chairperson. And uh, accordingly, I can now confirm that, um, as reported in the committee last week. They have not withdrawn. Uh, After extensive debate, the inquiry decided to proceed with its work amid political contestation. What I don't understand is why did they walk out of this committee last week? That is the part that we do not understand. And we were left with only one and a half witnesses that we were supposed to deal with. No one, not a single person, none whatsoever, ever uttered a word were withdrawing. It's you, members of the committee, who went around putting words in the mouth of the public protector's representatives. But this stalemate is also becoming a concern for the evidence leaders. Advocate Mpofu on Thursday indicated that his mandate after that application was refused that his mandate as the legal team was to do this application. And then he said, what that means is that we are not able to take part in any of the further, he called it illegal activities, which would go beyond the application. Upon resumption of the proceedings after the break, Chairperson Kubutile Janji said he noted the presence of her legal team and the committee resumed. After Mkwebane requested to be excused, citing a lack of representation from senior counsel, her request was dismissed. You think you are fine, I can proceed under you. I feel I can't proceed under you. Hence, I said to you, then you need a third person, that third empire, who would say, but then is that the proper environment to proceed? Meanwhile, the evidence leader led brief evidence with senior manager in the office of the public protector, Cornelius van der Merve. His evidence related to previous testimony that Mkwebane hired consultants to clean up her image, costing about half a million rand. Van der Merve testified that three consultants, Kim Heller, Professor Siposiepe, and attorney Paul Ngobeni were appointed without being on the public protector's supplier database. The inquiry continues on Wednesday. Ulelani Philip, SABC News, Parliament. Well, on the line to give us some clarity on some of those issues is the chairperson of the parliamentary committee looking into Busuwa Mkwabana's fitness to hold office, and that's Mr. Kubudile Janji. Mr. Janji, good evening. Thanks very much um, for your time. The inquiry continues um, tomorrow. What will be happening tomorrow? 
Good, good evening, uh, Budvoyo and uh, the viewers of 404 SABC Watchdog. Tomorrow we are continuing leading evidence of the last witness, mm -hmm. of the witnesses that we have identified as the committee. Uh, Mr. Niels van Amerve is the last of those witnesses. Uh, the entire day tomorrow will be leading his evidence. Thereafter, it will be up to the public protector legal team to cross-examine him, as well as uh, the outstanding witness, Ms. Nelisiwe Tejane. After that, we looking forward to have the public protector herself understand to tell us why she must be exonerated. So her legal team is still with her? Well, her legal team is still with her. That's what the public protector confirmed uh, immediately on Thursday, again on Friday, that she, there's, there's been no termination of mandate or withdrawal of it. We, we, we got the same today in a written form from her to say she would have had an opportunity to discuss with them. Uh, the legal team remains that legal team. I would have corresponded with the, with the, the, the attorneys of, of record, uh, over the weekend, and they've responded this morning to say they have not terminated their, their mandate with the public protector, they remain the attorneys of, of, of record. So the legal team, in, in all intents and purposes, remains intact. intact. The issue, Budvoyo, is uh, the response we got today, the saying to us that what you and I saw on Thursday, the walking out of Advocate in Pofu, mm -hmm. followed by the attorneys, that what we saw did not happen. In essence, that's what they were, they were saying, because I would have summed up that discussion as I went into my ruling as a chair, that uh, members' questions remain unanswered uh, in relation to if this remains your legal team, uh, why did they walk out? What does that mean? Did they get instruction from you to do that? And she denies all of those. Okay, well, um, we did and did, I mean, see that um, in that package that uh, our colleague uh, Bulalani Philip uh, prepared for us. But then she subsequently, uh, not too long ago, spoke on, on, on our sister show, um, the, full, the Full View, where she raised a number um, of uh, other issues uh, that um, she had asked for a few days, uh, which uh, you didn't give her. Uh, she says you also allowed her to be attacked in front of you. Uh, let's take a listen to what, uh, to what, what uh, to she, she, she had to say a little earlier when she appeared uh, on our sister program, The Full View. Compare me requesting five days or few days with the chairperson taking three weeks to decide who's stalling the process. And unfortunately, the very same legal person, I requested those uh, notes or whatever she was saying in writing so that we can deal with that. I mean, we quoted um, SCA judgments, constitutional court judgments, even international jurisprudence showing what is meant of us appearing before a compromised chairperson and uh, Mr. Melham. And they could, he continued, Mr. Melham, today to even say we are un disingenuous. I mean, attacking my legal team at first, but now me personally appearing before the committee, not being the member of the committee, and apparently uh, the chairperson is saying uh, that is, un is not unparliamentary. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, you know, and even the chairperson, I'm still waiting for the reasons because I said in my presentation, I need to know what reasons is he giving to proceed irrespective of the fact that I don't have my legal representation. Mr. Janji. Thank you, Budvoyo. Uh, let, let, let me do this. The, 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 the main purpose of our work is that we must do this inquiry 
as the National Assembly and as members of parliament in a fair, rational, and within reasonable time. And I want to connect that with what the constitutional court, the last court in the land, would have said in a case between speaker and, and the public protector, that the exercise of holding the public protector accountable is not the sort of matter that should be dragged out. And there is strong public interest in finalizing such an important matter. We've got to balance here the fairness we provide rationality that that can be an elastic process, unending. Uh, there's, there's, there's no end in sight. We've got to balance that with the need for us to do, to discharge our work within a particular time. So no amount of, uh, of, of defocusing us, of, of throwing any blackmail would, 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 would make us uh, be derailed in, in, in that task. On the issue of the language used, I, I would have said that using the word disingenuous is not unparliamentary. And in any case, it's not an insult. It might be hard and very robust when somebody raises that with you. But on the delays, you heard her saying you the one, um, if there's anyone delaying these proceedings, it is you. You took three weeks to decide on what she reckons was a matter you could have decided uh, within a very short space of time. Two things about that. At immediately on the 21st of September, when we listened to the application then, because the application then was for a chooser, I, I would have indicated to the PP and the legal team that within two weeks we would come back. Uh, but we added another week, which in our view it was important that we also receive the legal opinion, but also allow her time to prepare herself for what is coming, because we're only left, as the other member was saying, one and a half witness. And you can't even compare the two things here. They are just incomparable in terms of the kind of reasons, because I was given 12 grounds um, for, for, for recusal, and, and I committed on the spot that we will do paragraph by paragraph all of those 12 rounds in detail. The response, if tomorrow it were to go to court, uh, we would not be found wanting. It was necessary we do that. There's no regret on it. As far as uh, she is concerned, all these um, issues you are arguing over, or all this toing and froing. Um, and tempers flaring at times point to one thing, and that is uh, that um, uh, you uh, have a predetermined outcome, I think is how she calls it. Let's take a listen to what uh, she had to say um, on, on this one. Tomorrow I'm instructed to go. I'll go and sit there, but I'll also ask the chairperson whether must I sit there, even though I'm not participating, because now I'm I'm just sitting there, uh, and I don't know what's the use for me to sit there because um, the, I'm not part of the of the proceedings. Uh, I must appear there with my legal representation, especially uh, the council. And I mean. If the council is busy with the papers, I mean, the DA submitted around 2,000 pages on Friday. Those documents must still be perused and they must still go through it. And uh, we've got the DA having applied for an appeal within a few hours and the president within a day when they had 15 days. Definitely one will have to get time with the legal team, prepare for that. Whilst on the other hand, uh, we need to, to read and prepare for the, the, the witnesses. And besides that, Bongi, our witnesses as well must prepare affidavits. They, those affidavits must be submitted at least seven days before they are heard because the committee members must go through their statements and the evidence. Even my affidavit, the same thing must happen. So... I don't know what's the rush. Uh, people are rushing. There's no time and uh, trampling on my rights. Uh, unfortunately, then rendering the whole process to be as if they've got a foregone conclusion on um, their, their, their decision. 
You continue to trample on her rights, she says. Here's the factual journey with Vuyo. From day one, the day I was elected as a chairperson, if you go back on the record, I would have placed on record that we are starting this process with no predetermined outcomes. We, ha we have no briefcase of decisions with us. And we have driven this committee led from the front uh, in that particular way. Even when there were parties that went there with a, a particular attitude of saying, uh, she's, she's, she's innocent, why do you drag her into the inquiry? This is an approach that we took. Four things just to respond on what you're saying. Firstly, the postponement that they sought was a postponement pending a, an intention uh, on, in the high court for to determine the recusal matter. Basically in essence, and I'm, I'm going to break it down in this way. They came there last Thursday to say, we want you to postpone this inquiry or otherwise we're going to court, was 60% in court. Uh, and when we, we declined that, they did not go to court, you saw a walkout. Mm -hmm. Two, there's no legal impediment. There's no court order uh, for us not to proceed. Three, that the PP's legal team is made up of five people. It's a big legal team. It's not one person team. And there's no reason why that work cannot be shared with such a big legal team that is paid so much. Mm -hmm. Fourth, you can't have this committee. Every time there's a court application, we must stop and do nothing. We have work to do. And we're proceeding as such. Uh, let me give some feedback from uh, a couple uh, of people in the one minute that I have who have uh, uh, sent through some tweets. I have Mutenda Tenda saying, I think there is some wrong with the committee chair, Richard Yanchi, the way he is forcing the work to continue, no matter how many times PP is asking a few days and always allowed her to be attacked. You are being unfair with PP advocates on Kweban numerous times. Let's take a quick second one. You can answer to both of them. Um, can you ask a guest uh, the, from that committee that seeks to serve Mkwebane unfairly, is it procedural for anyone to have no representation in any hearing? If that person says she will not be served well without a legal, uh, is that a fair procedure? Quick answers to those. This, this committee has not refused the PP the legal representation would have carried a particular position and the constitutional court had the final say. Today we proceeded and we had the attorneys of record present, uh, present, uh, because the constitutional court said there must be legal representative or legal practitioners. It did not say it must be a senior counsel that must be there. And we proceeded as such, and I indicated that Sianejo uh, attorneys are not going to be excused. Um, there is no leave of absence for them. And we're continuing as such even tomorrow. So, Kanji, thank you very much uh, for your time this evening. Gosim Kolo. Gosim is the chairperson uh, of uh, that parliamentary committee looking into the public protector's fitness to hold office. After the break, Malusi Gigaba on his quest to become the next ANC Secretary General. Once upon a time, the ANC is rising star. But allegations surfaced that during the time he was a cabinet minister, he was one of the people who enabled state capture. That's when many thought the former ANC Youth League president star had eclipsed. Well, Malusi Kigaba and those backing him now believe he can rise again and become the party's next secretary general. Come the governing party's elective conference next month. He joins me in studio for a conversation. Good evening, sir. Thanks very much for your time. Good evening. Um, my pleasure being here. So, so at what point did you say, yes, I'm going to do this? Well, I was approached um, to consider standing. And um, I've been a member of the National Executive Committee of the ANC for 26 years running. Um, I've served under all the post-apartheid uh, presidents of the ANC. 
I've been president of the ANC Youth League for eight years, three consecutive terms. Um, and so when I was asked to consider standing for this position, I, I accepted uh, the challenge. Um, Did you ask why me? <clears throat> yes and no. Yes, because um, you, you want to understand why you, why this specific position? Because the people nominating you have got to have an idea. They can't just come to you and say, stand for a particular position and not explain their rationale for it. We have a situation of um, a lot of candidates for all positions. I think it's unprecedented in the history of the ANC that this is the case. Um, and I think as President Mbegi has been um, commenting, you actually, in many instances, don't get the rationale why um, a person is being considered for a particular position. In some instances, you have uh, people who've never served in, in any senior structures of the ANC also availing themselves. Uh, certainly, there will be a rationale, as there was uh, one for me. Why do you think, though, you have this, as you call it, and correctly, uh, unprecedented situation where there are so many candidates, I mean, uh, contesting each um, of, the, of the positions, four for president. Uh, I think at last count was eight and eight and ten uh, for deputy president. So many of you, I mean, there's Fikile Mbalola, there's mention of uh, uh, several others for the position of uh, secretary general. Why do you think that is? It's uh, because of a number of reasons. Uh, one of those reasons is the drop in the quality of the membership of the ANC and the quality of its leadership, which means everybody sees themselves suitable to occupy leading positions in the movement, regardless of whether they have the necessary gravitas, they have the necessary pedigree, the necessary track record um, and, and skill. But also it's because of um, the, the challenge which I regard as the bar has been removed. There is no bar. And in the absence of the bar, you don't have to lift your foot to jump the bar. You just simply have to walk. Even if you're tracking your feet, you are crossing um, the, 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 that non-existent bar. And, and that's the challenge. Uh, and that's why uh, that speaks to the responsibility for the next leadership of the movement to increase the intensity of the renewal of the movement politically, organizationally, and in terms of the socio-economic programs that it has to implement so that we attract into the ANC people who have the genuine interests of the movement um, and, and, and who understand the historic mission of the African National Congress. Uh, you obviously um, don't think that you are one of the people who shouldn't even be considering uh, raising your hand um, for a position, uh, I mean, in the, in the, in, in the top six. Um, can you repeat the question? I'm saying you obviously don't think that you are one of those people who shouldn't even be considering uh, availing themselves. Oh. No, no, no. Um, I, I, I certainly qualify in every respect to raise my hand for consideration for leading positions in the African National Congress. As I say, um, I have the necessary um, history, the, the relevant experience and pedigree. Um, and and um, I possess the, the foresight required for these responsibilities. But I guess knowing where you are going uh, with this question, uh, I would say to you that um, I, I have answered to all the allegations which have been leveled against me. I've answered to these allegations so much so, much so to a point that even the final, even the report, the penultimate report, before the one that was amended specifically for me, um, did not contain um, any serious recommendations regarding uh, my person. But I think immediately after it was made public that I had raised my hand uh, and availed myself for this position, um, under the pretext that uh, typographical errors were going to be corrected in the final report, the report came back containing quite serious commentary about myself. So it was quite clear 
that the pretext for the amendment of the report was, um, was, was, was deceitful. And, and so the intention, the actual intention of the amendments was to include me, particularly the recommendation that I should be investigated for all manner of um, uh, ludicrous allegations which were made uh, by a witness whom I still believe should not have been considered as the star witness of the commission. And uh, that's your former wife? I do not want to make mention of any names. Okay. But now, let's start with foresight. So someone could say, well, you should have had the foresight to see that uh, the Gupta family was bad for you, it was bad for your organization, the ANC, it was bad for our country. And you couldn't see uh, through what was happening. I mean, you did, for example, admit that, uh, uh, I mean, at the, at, the, at, the, at the inquiry, that people like Shama, for example, um, Iqbal, you know, I mean, you, 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 you appointed and facilitated certain, you know, conversations where he got a lot of work at your ESCOMs, uh, you appointed him to like a uh, transnet and so on. So uh, let, let's stick with that, like the foresight you were talking about. Let but me, could, you, could you not or did you not see and do you not now have regrets, you know, for having had those relationships with those types of people? Let me first say, uh, to correct you, I did not facilitate anything for anyone and that I have made very, very clear that at no stage did I facilitate anything for anyone. Um, I, I stand by um, that um, statement. But secondly, you know, foresight is um, different from being a sangoma, you know. You, you know someone, you meet someone, um, you know them in the context of everybody else knowing them. Because at the end of the day, um, many other people, including those who didn't come to the commission, knew this family um, and, and knew them very well. Um, they were hosted by them, they hosted them, they shared platforms with them, they shared tables with them at various activities. And you, you wouldn't know that um, at a certain stage in the future such and such a thing would come up. But at a certain point when I became uncomfortable with the relationship, I cut it loose um, because that was based on my own experience, not any um, ability to read the future, which I still do not possess. There are still many people whom I know today. I do not know what their fate will be um, or what allegations they will be facing in the future. And I cannot be held responsible for, um, for not knowing what um, allegations will be raised against those people in the future. Since, as I say, I do not possess the, super, the superficial um, uh, ability uh, to, to, to read somebody's future. Well, I mean, you are correct in, in, in one sense, in that, I mean, lots of people knew these people. But um, some people did see through their nonsense. I sat with the family. I mean, I did stuff. Uh, with them, but we could see through the nonsense early on, and we had to cut ties then. The point I'm making is that perhaps you acted much later when damage was, uh, um, was, was already done. Not, not really. You know, it, it depends on the extent to which you interact with a person, your ability to see, and, and, and the things they do when they are interacting with you. Um, if, if I interact with you, I've known you for a long time, uh, I wouldn't know what other experiences other people have in relation to you, which I have not experienced. So I don't take my, my relationship with a person based on an experience which often would not have been shared with me. But as soon as I knew on my own um, that, look, I'm, I'm not happy with the following things, I decided to cut ties um, and, and I never looked back. But, but knowing what you know now, everything that has surfaced, do you not at the very least regret um, even having known uh, um, 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 these people? All of this, of course, with the benefit of hindsight. With the benefit of hindsight, indeed. 
um, and you know you you only wish that um, you you had known much earlier you had experienced what you experienced later much earlier but as you say it's all based on the benefit of hindsight um, and as i say i did not facilitate anything for them and you don't regret the minute or the day uh, you actually knew these people <laughs> look I, I would not have known at the time so um, it, it's the same with everybody else. If, if I go around with the expectation that at some point in your life or in my knowing you, you may do something that um, um, would be unpalatable and would cause public um, consternation, certainly I would uh, cut ties with you. But to have known someone is part of the experience of developing and growing up it sharpens you uh, for the future. It makes you a better person in terms of your reading of people, your understanding of different individuals that you interact with, and, and therefore um, the responsibilities that you may hold in the future. But I mean, your organization is talking about renewal. It's talking about Absolutely. Uh, you know, rebuilding. You know. Um, and uh, in the position that you'd occupy, if you, if you get it, you'll be at the driver's seat. You will be running this organization on a full-time basis. You know that everyone and every structure and everything meets there in the office of the Secretary General. And uh, I mean, a part of growing up is being able to admit, you know, um, at certain points that I may have erred here. I made a mistake there. I regret having done A, B, C, and D because it was wrong. You know? and, 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 that, and that's really where I'm at. No, I'm not, I'm not denying regret. I'm not denying regret at all. I'm just simply saying that you, you need to understand that experience in context. Um, I don't possess metaphysical powers. And to the extent that there are many things which are said to have been done by, certain, by those individuals, yes, I regret having met them um, and, and having known them and associated with them. But what I'm saying is, understand it in context. I do not have metaphysical powers. And to the extent that I myself um, conscientiously decided that I am cutting this relationship even though I had not done anything to, um, uh, for them. I, I, I think that um, I've, um, um, you know, put myself in a better position to occupy any position in the in the African National Congress, and have learned from my own experiences. Uh, what do you think um, is responsible for the state that the, uh, the 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 ANC is finding itself in? Um, um, right now. And perhaps uh, before you answer that, uh, something stuck me, uh, I mean, stuck with me um, watching uh, someone else who's also running for the same position, Pumolo um, Maswale, talking about, for example, the step aside uh, 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 rule. Now, here is something that uh, has been, because Precisely because of the history we were talking about, you know, uh, the wrongs that have, been, that have been committed. And here's one thing which a lot of people praise as a, like a very bold and necessary step where people say if, you know, you're finding yourself in this, uh, you, you're compromised, um, you have charges, you know, uh, level against you for the sake of uh, this movement do the right thing and step aside because the last thing the ANC deserves, according to those who are, who are supporting this, is being held like insults and, uh, you know, being held at it because of people who are compromised but who continue to want uh, to lead what was with this once this glorious movement. In fact, take a listen to how uh, uh, Pumulo Moswale uh, put this. I think we've got to subject it to further scrutiny mm -hmm. because in some instances we rely on decisions or actions that are outside of our control. 
which may make us look to be opportunistic in actually uh, carrying out that is implementing this. Let me just make you an example. You've referred to uh, the matter to do with uh, uh, from, uh, Comrade Ace Mahashole. Uh, in my view, uh, with all the goings on in the case, at least there should have been a period of reconsidering whether or not we still go along with the effective suspension as it is. Uh, I think uh, you might have cases running much, much longer. Uh, I think we've got for that reason to, to come back. And some of the cases run that much long only for the person to uh, yeah. to be cleared. We've had a similar case in Pumalanga where people were charged but uh, in no time uh, charges were withdrawn, the persons were cleared. So I think we need to revisit it such that the actions we take are in the purview where we have absolute control so that we can apply this evenly without there being an impression that there is selectiveness or there is targeting of some individuals. It's for that reason that uh, I feel strongly that we've got to subject the step, step aside uh, policy or uh, guidelines to give effect to that, subject them to review once again, scrutinize them such that you make them free of any suspicions, but also strengthen them to the extent that they assist you achieving the objective. The objective is to ensure that individuals do not burden the ANC with allegations that they have to themselves. Your thoughts? Look, I think I, I agree with him wholeheartedly. I mean, at the end of the day, there are two factors which matter here. One is how comprehensive on the one hand, and how easily, how easy to implement is this, is this decision. It must, be, it must be practical, it must be practicably, practicable, uh, but it must also be comprehensive enough to, you know, to uh, mitigate the risks of abuse. But the other level is the leadership. The leadership must be objective enough to implement this decision without fear or favor. But, the issue of step aside for me is not the biggest challenge the African National Congress is facing. The mistake we made even as we came out of the National Policy Conference was, and it was made not only by the, the, the closing addresses at the, at the policy conference, but also by media commentary, is to make the issue of step aside the biggest challenge for the African National Congress. Um, as though the National Policy Conference was about that. And again, we cannot make the National Conference to be about the step-aside rule. There are serious challenges that are faced by the African National Congress in, in, in leading the National Democratic Revolution and uh, in providing leadership to society as a whole. The most important one of which is, is, is at an economic level, the challenges of unemployment. We have record unemployment in the country. We are facing serious rupture with regards to state-owned enterprises as a result of which Dinel at some point was unable to pay salaries. At some point, Transnet recorded a loss and uh, is, is failing to meet its targets. Um, and as a result of which we are experiencing load shedding which threatens the future of our children as at this point as we sit for exams. So the biggest challenge for the ANC is really not the step aside rule. It's on socio-economic transformation, and that's where we need to di direct all our attention. But we'll get into that, I mean, in a, in, in a second. But just to finish a uh, thought on that one. You see, the reason you, you, you may argue that, I mean, that's not, step aside is not, uh, you know, the biggest challenge facing um, this country. But for the first time in a very long time, and on the back of everything that had happened around state capture and uh, what we have seen and heard, the ANC, or just some people within the ANC, were now prepared, you know, um, to say, this can continue. 
And it was something that showed, as I was saying earlier, South Africans, that there are people who believe that something needs to be done for the ANC to restore uh, its dignity, but also to be the leader of society that it says it is. And you will have heard from various arguments that people are making that the bar, as you were saying right at the beginning, should be higher. In other words, ANC cadres should be judged by standards higher than, you know, uh, precisely because we are a leader of, of society. So the bar has to be up there. And those who argued for this step aside rule were trying to do precisely that. And I don't think you can falter them because um, it, will, it may, as uh, Pumula Maswala was arguing, affect certain people. It means that they may not be eligible to be, you know, I mean, the bar should be set higher. That and is that's not, the whole point. That, is not, that is not even the biggest concern. The biggest concern is the abuse of the rule. That By is the who? biggest concern. By the South African judiciary acting in cahoots with certain politicians to ensure that certain people are eliminated from the leadership of the movement. Now, you, you cannot discount that because as we see it, for example, we do not know um, which among our judges were, were, were involved in the, in the, uh, in the sealed files. Um, from the National Conference of 2017 because those decisions have been sealed. And there are serious concerns. Justice must not only be done, it must also be seen to be done. And in our instance, people are saying that um, some cases are deliberately, you are charged before there is a charge sheet and therefore you must step aside, you are subjected to a protracted process of going to court your case is being uh, 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 postponed and postponed and postponed. So we, we, we've got to address the totality of the issues which surround this rule. But as I'm saying, the rule itself is not the biggest challenge facing the African National Congress. As you correctly say, the, it was meant to solve mischief. But there is another mischief that it has created. We've got to solve that mischief in a very rational manner. In my opinion, we can solve the mischief re regarding um, the step-aside rule in a, in, in a manner that addresses the comprehensiveness of the rule so that you, you, you don't subject it to abuse. But on the other hand, by ensuring that the leadership has the objectivity required to implement the rule in, in a rational and objective manner, and as Comrade Pumulo suggests, regularly reviews because that condition, that provision for review is contained in, in the existing resolution. But the African National Congress at its conference took another decision which is beyond the, the step aside rule when it came to renewal and charged the president of the ANC with the responsibility to lead the renewal effort supported by the officials and the leadership of the ANC. And, and that is the, the work, the big work that needs to be, to be undertaken according to the resolution of the national conference. And these are the issues that um, we, we, we have got to come back to as we discuss the renewal of the ANC and its ability to provide this leadership that is um, ethical and credible to society to restore the prestige of the African National Congress as the leader of our society. But why must um, the inefficiencies of the criminal justice system uh, not be about years of neglect, um, years of not making sure that our criminal justice system functions properly, compounded, of course, by, I mean, years of uh, useless appointments, you know, uh, where it matters, like your crime intelligence, the infightings uh, that we saw, and how the people who ran those institutions down, right? They were not, I'm saying they were the best uh, institutions that we could, we could have, uh, but there was stuff you could work on. But instead of those, the, 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 those areas being strengthened where we're doing well, they were weakened instead. So why is the reason, in fact, that there are judges who may have been involved um, in the sealing of files and not about, because a fair appraisal 
of your criminal justice system, I think would go a long way making South Africans understand what has gone wrong over the years. And the same can be said about whether you're talking about ESCOM, whether you're talking about SAA, um, whether you're talking about, about Transnet. I mean, ESCOM reports, I remember, I mean, back in uh, Adrian Hartland and uh, uh, the late Professor Kada Asmal's book, you know, about, um, about ESCOM, you know, how report after report came before cabinet to say, you need to do this, you need to invest um, in ESCOM, you need to take decisions about the future of ESCOM, which is the future of, of, our, uh, of, our, of our energy. Nothing was done. The reports were ignored. Nothing was done about the issues that were being raised. And we're partly where we are, compounded those problems by what happened. I mean, the evidence is there. People who made huge amounts of money uh, while all they were doing was to take away from, you know, from public coffers. So, I mean, the, what I'm saying is the analysis has to be, has to be fair and it has to be thorough and there, there are no corners and it shouldn't be like a convenient to find certain answers, you know, for big problems that in fact those of you who have been in the executive for many, many years should actually account for. Indeed, the analysis has got to be thorough and comprehensive, but it must also, um, you know, we, we, in, in how we approach the matter, we must uh, not seek to make excuses for instances where there is a clear abuse of, of the process. And in this instance, um, there is a genuine concern. You know, ANC members wouldn't go to the policy conference uh, from Limpopo to other provinces saying, scrap this rule because it prejudices people without recourse um, when in actual fact they are being uh, upset and irrational. It's based on real experiences which uh, people are confronting, which have nothing to do with uh, the historical incompetences and inefficiencies of the criminal justice system, but are based on current um, uh, um, um, uh, conduct of the system, which makes people believe that justice is neither being done, nor is it being seen to be done. Now, let's, let's shift to um, the, the, the second aspect that you, you, you spoke about. Very good analysis that you are making and, and, and the, the problems with our state-owned enterprises being historical problems, affecting all of them in actual fact. But in some instances, not so long ago, Transnet had a very, had an independent credit rating and a very strong one compared to the sovereign credit rating. But where is Transnet now? Uh, what is happening to it, for the first time it has gone to seek, to seek um, a, a bailout from uh, the Minister of Finance as we had in the MTBPS. The problems at ESCOM, um, historical lack of investment in, in new infrastructure generation capacity, uh, which has resulted in um, the, the, the capacity constraints, imbalance, the, the, the capacity imbalance in terms of the generation and supply of electricity. But there are also just uh, a plain problems of um, management and administrative incompetency um, which have not and are not going to be helped, even by the board which has been um, uh, recently appointed because um, of the, 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 the competencies they possess, but also because of the fact that, um, you know, we are still not generating enough electricity to power industry and the country. And we are not building new power stations. Therefore, the result is that um, load shedding, um, the, the, the generation, the demand supply imbalance is going to continue for the foreseeable future. Um, I don't see this board uh, succeeding in, in dealing with uh, all of these challenges. Um, some of them were at ESCOM before um, and, and so they are not going to uh, provide any uh, novel ideas about how to solve these issues. So what I'm saying to you is that the, the, the issues of the renewal of the African National Congress must take all of the things you are talking about comprehensively, address them, not only confine itself to internal processes, programs and problems of the ANC, but above everything else, 
the renewal of the ANC must be for the purpose of improving the quality of lives of our people, addressing the problems of landlessness, of unemployment, the problems of the capacity of the state. We talk about developing, about creating a developmental state, and I think we are just simply not doing that. Well, someone will say, well, in the 26 years that you served in the uh, National Executive Committee, those are the issues that uh, should have preoccupied uh, the leadership core of, uh, of, of the ANC, and they clearly, oh, yes. they clearly went. Oh, yes, they have. They have preoccupied us at a certain stage in this country. But, 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 but it's not showing any results. That's no, point. no, no. The, we, we have had ups and downs along the way, inconsistencies in, in policy formulation and uh, the policies of the African National Congress. We've moved in 1994 from the RTP to Kia in, in 1996, which prioritized privatizing um, SOEs and other infrastructure, um, even though the, that macroeconomic framework did result in the creation of employment, of sustained employment over a period. But we reached a stage where it became unsustainable and the jobs that were created were not sufficient to get the majority of our people working. So you, you have had those inconsistencies which need to be addressed because no, no country, not even the Chinese, um, have built China to where it is today um, out of the correct decisions from the outset. At a certain point in 1978, all the way from 1949, okay. they decided to change, to change policy and direction, see the, the results that, has, that this has produced for the okay. communist, for China. And, and the ANC in December must do the same. We have okay. got to focus on social economic transformation. Okay, quick. So we're just going to take a quick, uh, a few uh, tweets and then your, your, closing, your closing comments. Let's see how many we can uh, take. I know we have run out of time. Um, Bravo, you ask Malusi, what are these things that made him cut ties and was not happy about from the Guptas? He didn't see from that time when they were allowed to land at Waterkloof and treated differently from South Africans by the very same... Uh, Zuma government. Let's take another one. Um, good evening. I don't think Eva can come after his roller coaster shenanigans with the Guptas. He has a lot to answer and put the country into his confidence about his less corrupt relations with the Guptas. You want to quickly take those? Look, they, they, are, um, they are baseless comments uh, based not on the facts that one has provided but uh, based on the uh, intransigence of the people who are holding these views. The fact of the matter, as I have said, I did not have any shenanigans. Um, I related with them in the same manner that any other person related with them or, or that many other people related with them. I cut ties when I realized that um, they, 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 they were compromising me, including uh, uh, through that landing at uh, Waterkloof Air Base. Mm -hmm. and, and I realized that it, 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 it is not a relationship worth maintaining. Mm -hmm. Let's take one or two on the ANC. Let's see what we can uh, able to uh, uh, bring up very uh, quickly. Um, Okay, it looks like we're not able to bring up um, those tweets. There were a, a couple I understood uh, that were okay. Here's Comrade Maluski But today the ANC Youth League has become non existent under your watch and of Comrade Figil and Balula as former leaders of the ANC Youth League. Today you all want to become Secretary General of the ANC. Where are you guys going to come in after allowing the destruction of the ANC Youth League? Let's see if we can cut another one ANC related. How can we revive the African National Congress? Let me comment about the ANC Youth League. The ANC Youth League is a vital instrument. Mm. We don't quick one, yeah, quickly. But in, in 2012 at the National Conference, so it's not correct that it has died under our watch. Um, in 2012 at the National Conference, I stood up to um, oppose the motion that was put for the dissolution of the ANC Youth League. I was supported by Comrade Sihle Zigalala back then. And, and we have tried our best. Um, if if uh, the Comrade is uh, sincere enough, he would um, be aware that uh, we have really been uh, crisscrossing the country, assisting the youth movement, providing some political support to the ANC Youth League, to SASCO and other youth organizations, mm -hmm. so that we can rebuild them. So we've been part of the process of the revival and rebuilding of the ANC Youth League. Okay, Abba. All I can say is 
best of luck, but thank you very much for coming through. Pleasure is all mine. Thank you. See uh, what comes out of uh, uh, this campaign, of course, once uh, come December. And that's our show for tonight. Do join us again tomorrow evening, same time.